Uh, so um, I really only want to convince you of one thing here, which is that the growth of poor world megacities, the growth of uh, poor world urbanization is one of the most important phenomena in the world today. And it creates enormous scope for market design, for problems that are both socially important and absolutely fascinating. Um, so let me start with a, a graph of the world. Uh, and what I'm showing you here is by income category, and of course they're both in 2012 dollars, I'm showing you the share of countries in each income group that is more than one-third urbanized. The one-third urban is a relatively arbitrary fact, but any way you cut this, it will show you basically the same phenomenon, which is if you look at countries that are four to $5,000 per capita income or three to 4,000, both in 1916 today, they're about 80% of them are more than one-third urban. They're, they're generally fairly urban places. The big difference in this graph is here, okay? What share of countries with per capita incomes below $1,000 were more than one-third urban in 1960? Easy number to remember. The number is zero, not a one. Right? For indeed, as throughout almost all of human history, to be poor was to be rural, to be rural was to be poor. Now, all of a sudden, more than 40% of these countries are more than one-third urban. Go to one to 2,000, the growth is between 20% and almost 60%, an enormous shift. Right? One that we can use the tools of trade and growth theory to actually make sense of, but that's not my point today. The point today is actually dealing with the challenges of urbanization, dealing with the demons that also come with density. As much as there are very positive things associated with urban growth, there is also crime, contagious disease, congestion of roads, high housing costs, etc. This is another way of just seeing this growth. These are the UN pr projections. Uh, I would take those with a grain of salt. Uh, but in any case, you see the enormous growth in urbanization in Asia and Africa uh, that is likely to continue. Um, one of the things, of course, that has happened with the growth of poor world urbanization is you have a lot of countries that are down here. Now, along the x-axis here, I have the share of the population that's urban. Along the y-axis, I have the ratings of government effectiveness. So what this now means, because of the growth of poor world urbanization, is that you have a lot of countries that are both highly urban and incredibly badly run. Okay? So you not only are dealing with the downsides of urbanization with, with a lack of cash, you also are dealing with it with a lack of public resources as well. So, you know, 2,000 years ago, Julius Caesar was dealing with a million people in Rome with per capita incomes of maybe 1,500 bucks in modern dollars. But at least he had the political capacity to ban wheeled vehicles from the city of Rome during the daylight hours, right? You cannot do that today in Port-au-Prince. That will not happen. Um, okay, so you get places that feel like this. Actually, this is an upside. This is Dharavi, which in some sense is a magnificent example of human entrepreneurship, of the ability of cities to make markets, of people to learn what new opportunities are in the cities. It is also a magnificent example of the spread of contagious disease because of a lack of sewers and sanitation. The two things go together. The both positive and negative externalities that are bound in cities are a big deal. Unsurprisingly, this is per capita GDP. This is the share of the urban population using sanitation. When you have poor world urbanization, you're looking at a world without sewers, you're looking at a world without clean water. And indeed, it's hard not to think that the most important job of urban government is actually to deal with the water problem, because there is no crime wave that is as deadly as a cholera epidemic. Um, okay, before we get too down on cities, and this is just a, uh, I, I, and we're going to spend the whole rest of the time talking about bad stuff that happens in cities. I do just want to remind you that, in fact, forget about the income gaps between cities and non-urban non areas, which are, which are large. But in fact, if you just looked at self-reported life satisfaction and you looked at the gap between urban and rural residents across countries, in rich countries, it's pretty neutral. In New Zealand, uh, it's, you know, the rural guys say that they're a lot happier, which makes sense. But in poorer places, typically the urbanites say that they are much happier with their, with their lives. There's a big life satisfaction gap which favors cities. That, and I think the right answer, I mean, what you get from developing world leaders is my urban problem is I want to stop, figure out how to stop the poor people from coming to my city, right? That's, that's the response you get over and over again, which is very hard to see that that's the right answer. The right answer is surely to figure out how to improve the functioning of these cities in order to deal with the negative externalities, in order to deal with the downsides. One way of saying that externalities are everywhere in cities, it also means that missing markets are everywhere. And that's a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today. I mean, an externality is essentially a missing market in different ways. Pecuniary markets are missing in the developing world, both because of technology. Market poverty and thinness means that it it's, isn't worth paying whatever fixed cost markets require. And because of government policy, if anything, there's more of a dislike of pricing things in the developing world. Uh, not all of that is crazy. 
right? There are cases in which we think a land sale may be just to cover for a land theft under force. It's not, it's not totally crazy, um, but uh, you know, some of it probably is. And of course, there are other worries. You know, if you actually move to congestion pricing, if you actually priced public services properly, would that mean that only rich people would use them? In which case, would the subsidies that they're still getting essentially become subsidies purely for the rich? What would that do to the political economy of, of these? I don't know. So I've got five ideas related to markets and making markets and cities in the developing world. I'm going to get through as many of them as I can. Some of them are very simple. Uh, not all of them are mine. Uh, so the first one that I'm going to, going to point, at, point is really due to Jose Shankman. But it's, it's a comment about Brazil, and it's about markets and safety. And I don't know how many of you have, have ever thought of this, but um, all of you have thought about different ways of selling goods. So one way of selling goods is the one-on-one -on -one relationship, let's say, that you have with your dentist. Okay? Another is the anonymous, impersonal relationship you have with you, your grocer. Okay? You, can, you buy goods in these two different ways. In fact, in many cases, we're totally neutral about which one to sell them by. But once you go into a world of drugs, violence, and an absence of protection of property, right, one of these models is actually much safer than the other model. Because if you shoot the, the dentist, you don't get the dentist customers. Okay? If you walk into, you know, if you shoot a drug dealer, you don't all automatically get all of their customers. There may be still some violence around the edges, but if the drugs are sold not along the dealer model, but in fact, in, if there's an area of town that's understood, Alphabet City in the old New York, various parts of the favelas of Rio that are drug centers, that is an invitation to violence to seize that commercial space, right? to seize the open air market. Right? So in fact, this is a case in which the way that we sell things relates to the fact that you don't have rule of law and one creates an invitation for death while the other one does not. Second point, okay, economists have believed they know the right answer for traffic congestion for at least 55 years, okay? It is to price roads, right? Bill Vickery had this idea, the recent work by Gilles Dranton and Matthew Turner documenting the fundamental law of traffic congestion, the vehicle miles traveled increased roughly one for one with highway miles built, only supports the value of having pricing. There's not a technological problem with pricing. Singapore is actually moving from this model, which is pretty darn good, to a model in which the cars just have straight GPS coordinates that charge their credit cards based on, on the time of day, right? You can do this unbelievably efficiently if you wanted to, but of course, nobody wants to, right? We don't want to do it in the US. They certainly don't want to do it in much of the developing world. Just as a behavioral aside, you usually can do it with new roads because there's not sort of an endowment effect, but trying to slap tolls on old roads is enormously hard. Um, Many of the big gains from doing these congestion pricing schemes are from getting time of day right, moving people along to using different capacities. This is an area in which we could really use more mechanism and market design. So Jonathan Hall, not the Jonathan Hall of this paper, but the other Jonathan Hall, is a U of C PhD student, uh, has a great paper showing that you can actually do congestion pricing in a Pareto form by keeping half the roads open and making half the roads tolled. Right? which is a very nice sort of solving of this problem. In much of the developing world, they favor things like the even-odd scheme, so you can drive Tuesdays, Thursdays if you're even, and Mondays, Wednesdays if you're odd in your license plates. This is clearly wildly inefficient. Um, uh, Gabe Kreindler has a very nice paper on this. There is a question of whether or not you could do it better with something that feels a little bit more tradable, but you know, again, it's, it's hard to get it. Um, okay, so that's road pricing and mechanism design. Um, when we think about the cities of the developing world, the past of the wealthy world is sometimes helpful. This is the path of death rates in New York City over the past 200 years. Enormous gulf. Uh, it's a gulf that actually makes a point that I like to make, which is that engineering is necessary but not sufficient. Okay? America's cities would not have gotten safe if the cities were not spending as much on clean water as the federal government was spending on everything except for the post office and the army in 1900. But infrastructure alone is not sufficient. The great infrastructure in New York is the Croton Aqueduct, built in 1842. Any time series whiz here see a break in 1842, some massive reduction in mortality rates? Not at all. In fact, my great, 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 great grandfather died in that one the 1849 cholera epidemic, seven years after Croton was, was built. And the reason for this is that people continued to use the old technology because it was expensive to connect and poor people continued to use shallow wells, right? Um, it wasn't until you actually had behavioral adjustments in which you actually imposed fines on people who didn't connect to the, to the waterworks, who didn't connect to the sewers, that you didn't get this change. The issue of sewers and, um, and sh shallow wells Right, sewers, shallow wells, shallow wells versus piped in water, pit latrines versus sewers. This comes up over and over again in the developing world context, and it's a world about multiple technologies. There 
is, in so many cases, there are things like a cheap technology, and this is the cheap technology for moving around, which is uh, minibuses, jitneys, jeepneys in Manila. Uh, and this is the Gao train, an enormously slick train. All right? We have lots of examples of this, right? Sewage versus pit latrine, shallow well versus aqueducts, jitneys versus public BRT. Right? In what cases is the right answer, and as economists we have to grow up with this, is the right answer to actually push everyone from the old technology into the new one, which is probably the right answer with pit latrines in dense, in dense areas. In what area is the right answer to upgrade the minivans? Right, rather than to actually spend billions of dollars on a train system. And I think almost assuredly in the minivans it's right. Now, in most of these cases, you will still have some last mile problem that goes on, and that's exactly the, the point of the, of the water case. So these are guys in Zambia where I work on water so, who are not connected with this stuff. So Zambia, they build tons of infrastructure, and guys don't want to pay for the connection, just like the Croton Aqueduct. You need to have some way of dealing with this. And we have a, a little model of this, and I'll just, it has sort of a mechanism design feel, feel to this. Everything that you do in the developing world has to have the feeling of subversion. You can get people to adopt a new technology, to move to the healthier technology, to deal with the externalities, either by fining them if they don't do it or by subsidizing them if they do do it. You want to think of both of the pros approaches as being, having social costs. If you work it through subsidies, there's going to be huge waste in the subsidized service that's provider. Okay? And the way to think about this is this, uh, this parameter goes up here, captures how wastely the waste for the subsidy system is. If you try to do things through fines, people will be abused. Cops will hold people up, there will be extortion, and when it's really the fines are too large, the innocent will be distorted, extorted along with the weak, and nobody will be, will be any better off. You've got to think about those two trade-offs, and this is at least how we think about, uh, this is joint with Nava, Ashraf, and Giacomo Ponsetto, that you know, if the executive system is really good, you just do it all with subsidies. If the judicial system is really good, which is up here, you just do it all with fines. Right? If they're all good, it doesn't really matter. If they're both really bad, you give up and go home. Right? But there's a large range in the middle in which you want a combination of fines and subsidies. And the key point about the fine is it needs to be small enough to avoid extortion of the innocent. Right? And this exactly turns Gary Becker on his head. The sort of part of the point that we got out of, out of crime and punishment was that you wanted really high fines so that you actually don't want to, uh, you, you don't need to have high, high prob arrest probabilities. I think this is completely wrong in the developing world context. And this is a point that was made by David Friedman in his essay in the JP for, for, the, for Becker's, um, it was a Feshrift, it was a Feshrift thing, um, that in fact high fines are an invitation for abuse, an invitation for uh, extortion. Um, Last point I want to make is that New York, when they implemented this, also had a problem of corrupt police, just as bad as in any developing world context today. The difference with New York is we actually knew who owned the land, right? And that makes it easier to impose obligations on, on land ownership, like connecting to the sewers. Part of the problem of the developing world is we don't know who owns the land, which reminds us that their clear land ownership is a strong complement Right, for actually making these problems. Um, there's a, in the German basic law, there's a line which is property entails obligations. And it's true here as well. You've got to shovel away your, your snow. But if you're not going to be able to impose these rules without some sort of mechanism that gets us towards better ownership, lots of other reasons why we think land ownership is good. One of the things that Scott and I have been working on, uh, and Scott really, I'm not going to answer any of this, is, is a mechanism for actually allocating land in slums. So the idea here is you've got, a, you've got a situation which you don't know who owns what, and you've got to figure out a way where you first use a jury to allocate things, and then you have a bidding mechanism that works out. Ask Scott later. He'll be able to tell you, fill you all in on this. Uh, last, last point is about pro protecting property from abuse, uh, protecting property from theft, protecting property from eminent domain. These are also areas in which you want to think about the tools of mechanism design and market design uh, for being used. Um, just a simple idea that I've been working on with Andre Schleifer and Giacomo Ponsetto is, is the debate between injunction, which means injun you want to think about injunction as someone goes on your property, is doing something to your property, they are allowed to stop you from doing it, okay? Versus compensation, which means you go to a court and you get a fine Ex, ex post. Now, there's been a big fashion in law and economics for compensation rather than injunction over the past 30 years. And if the courts are perfectly efficient, okay, then compensation gets exactly right. You move a price in, essentially. You tell the polluter that they have to pay exactly what's going on. Now, how good do we think courts are in the developing world? This is the relationship between GDP ca per capita and the World Justice Project's es expert assessment of how often cases are uh, decided under pressure or corruption. So, you know, Cambodia, it's literally 100%. The, the, the judges that are, are viewing this. I don't want to you know, claim that these numbers are perfect, but anything that thinks that the judicial system is perfect in the developing world is going to be making a mistake. Two last points, since I know that I'm out of time. 
if you think that this judicial system is, bad, is, is problematic, this strongly increases the case for injunction relative to compensation. Compensation is a much more factually intensive process. It's a much easier thing to subvert. We have centuries of, of history of judges being subverted in terms of assessment of damages in both directions. So, by contrast, figuring out who actually owns the land or has some rights to it is a much easier thing to establish. And hence, injunction is probably the right answer uh, early on. The second thing which is related to this is mechanism designed around eminent domain, which turns out is exactly the same problem of compensation versus injunction. Eminent domain switches a property rule, switches the fact that you don't get to take my land until I say yes, to a price rule, to compensation rule, which is the government gets to take your land and give it to someone if they pay a price that a court establishes. Okay? We may think that that's fine in the US. Actually, a lot of people don't think it's fine because we trust the judicial system to establish the, 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 the values. Lots of worries in the developing world that that isn't, that isn't being done. You can modify the eminent domain taking, though, to a modified property rule, which is three-fourths three of the population need to say yes. Not 100% because that creates the holdout problem, but some modified acceptance rule, which is what India did in 2010. So it's moving along a continuous rule between property rules and liability rules. But my last point is one, these cities are incredibly interesting, they're incredibly important, they're just growing larger over time. The problems are both huge from a social welfare point of view and just incredibly interesting. Okay? And they're ones in which the problems of mechanism design and market design get changed because of the institutional framework is so, is so different. And you have to sort of approach everything with an understanding of that, that, that institutional weakness. Okay, I'm done. Thank you very much.